Truth Espresso, episode 163. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso, to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> And now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. This is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Well, hey there, Truth Espresso listeners. This is your host, Daniel Minnick, and this is another episode of Truth Espresso, and we just got back, my wife and I, Chelsea here, we just got back from a weekend marriage retreat hosted by our church, and I think it was a great time that we had together. Sweetheart, we got to learn some good tips about marriage, play some games, and, <laughs> and you know, meet some other couples. Uh, there are actually two uh, churches uh, that got together for this retreat, so we got to see some familiar faces, meet some new faces and all learn together from uh, an evangelist and his wife that uh, got to teach the uh, series of lessons on uh, marriage. And so, sweetheart, my beautiful, sweet co-host and wife, Chelsea, thank you for doing this again with me. (laughs) Yeah, good to be here, babe. (laughs) And so we are here to just kind of reflect on some of the things that we uh, learned with from the marriage retreat. But with a focus, we're going to talk about the question before you say I do. So we want to talk about or talk to possibly some of our younger listeners. Now, there are people who might even be our age who do get engaged or haven't gotten married yet. And so for anyone who is in the stage of life before marriage... Before you say, I do together, what are some of the things that you should prepare for, that you should actually talk about, that you should consider before you jump into this um, amazing and challenging institution in your life called marriage? Because you have someone else to love and you've got to be prepared for things that are different from when you're living the single life. and. <laughs> And one of those big things that has become more common today, and it seems like it's more needed today, is uh, premarital counseling. And so, sweetheart, want to look at some premarital counseling questions and things that should be asked for premarital counseling to help uh, people who are getting ready for marriage. Maybe they haven't thought about some things, and maybe some of these questions will help. Because <laughs> some people are ready to jump into marriage and not really think things through about what this is about. <laughs> and so, are you ready to talk about premarital counseling, sweetheart? <laughs> Sure. I have a few statistics for you, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Statistics are always good to really get us into perspective to think about. So, things like (laughs) how many people do premarital counseling and how much of an effect does it have? And so, yeah, what are some of those statistics, sweetheart? Yes. So, the first statistic I have comes from the website, thenot.com. And this says that couples who underwent premarital counseling actually had a 30% higher marital success. So they were more likely to stay married than end in divorce if they went through premarital counseling. The other statistic I was looking at was the average time couples spend in premarital counseling. And I was kind of surprised it was only eight hours was the average. Hmm. Because if you think about all the time, money, energy spent into planning the one day of the wedding, that's a lot of resources that you're putting into one day. Whereas premarital counseling is actually investing Mm, in the rest of your life as a married couple. (laughs) So I just think that premarital counseling and kind of what these statistics show is really important and a good stepping stone for entering into that covenant. 
And then one more kind of fun statistic <laughs> also from the knots. Statistics can be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so first I'll ask you, what do you think are the top two most popular days <laughs> to get engaged? Mm, popular days. Like, so are, are these like holidays? Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> There's no engagement day on the calendar you know, <laughs> so that okay if you're gonna get engaged get engaged on engagement day <laughs> well we're just ending the month of love february oh yeah so let me guess would one of them be valentine's day ding 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 <laughs> yes <laughs> one of the top two is valentine's day so what do you think the other one might be <laughs> And let's see. So we weren't engaged on the top <laughs> one, <laughs> but I guess we turned out okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if these probably aren't a, a litmus test for what, <laughs> the successful marriage, it's no, just, it has just to do with engagement. Popular. Yeah, most popular for engagement. Let's see. So Valentine's Day is number one. <laughs> number two. No. Oh, Valentine's Day is number two. Yes. Oh, okay. So now I got to figure out what number one is and it's not engagement day. Okay. <laughs> um, it's not boxing day, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. The uh, gift wrap oh, items. Yeah. So, um, so, okay. If Valentine's day is number two, it's about love and what better day or what better second day, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> to get engaged than a day focused on love and um so except for i guess number one is a day about giving gifts and i guess that would be christmas right yes good job <laughs> so christmas day is the number one most popular day to get engaged <laughs> nice so christmas is okay um well let's get engaged by the fact that i'm going to give you a gift on this day and then the second one is let's get engaged on according to the fact that today is focused on love so i guess that makes sense that those two are the top days for getting engaged and you know. yeah <laughs> We were close uh, to Christmas. <laughs> Is it? Well, they said that 40% of engagements occurred between Christmas or like December, I guess, mm -hmm. and February. Oh, wow. <laughs> so quite a large number of engagements do occur during those few months there. <laughs> wow. So the two most popular days and then probably third, fourth, fifth, just fall in the range between those days. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense because you have so many get togethers. Yeah. In between <laughs> those days. Yeah. <laughs> And like people on vacation, visiting family or flying out to visit, possibly if it's a, a long distance type thing, then, uh, yeah, flying out to visit, you both have free time, you're do, you know, going on dates and stuff, you know, not dealing with work days and, and hey, you know, <laughs> one of your Christmas gifts is this ring. <laughs> Christmas break from college. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> Now, Valentine's Day may not have that, you know, advantage there, but hey, the day of love. So, uh, you know, might as well show it with uh, a ring that seals that love. <laughs> One more statistic Ooh. for you. <laughs> so what do you think the average length of time a couple is engaged for? Who? Let's see. And I'm sure this has changed over time, right? <laughs> um, yeah, not by much, though. Oh, okay. Let me see. <laughs> I, I know I've seen, you know, kids in college where their engagement is for the college period, but <laughs> that's probably not the most common length of time, like two to four years or something, but I'll guess six months. Ah, <laughs> that's a good guess. Okay. How, so in um, 2019, <laughs> sorry, were you going to ask something? Oh, no, I, I was going to ask, how um, okay. how off am I? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so according to the 2019 study, they found that most people were engaged for 15 months. Oh, okay. <laughs> which was kind of longer than I was thinking. Yeah, because that, that's a lot longer than six months. <laughs> that's more than <laughs> twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what are your thoughts on long engagements? Do oh. you think that's a good thing, a bad thing? Does it matter? Hmm. I'm sure it differs by the couple and possibly the reasons for why it would 
could be longer, you know, like if they have to do more planning, if, if there, someone has to finish up something or they're working on saving up for a house and they want to get married, move into the house, or if someone's finishing up college, you know, it might make it longer. But otherwise, I think long engagements could tend toward breaking off and stuff. Now, you don't want to say, okay, you got to have a short engagement so that you're like, you've locked in and you're trapped and you don't have much time to vet anything. But at the same time, when you have really long engagements, there's the temptation of people to not take it seriously and then end up breaking it off. And <laughs> Also, I think the temptation of falling into um, a premarital relationship is higher too because yeah. you're drawing closer together and mm. the longer you draw that out <laughs> then the likelihood of the couple like falling into that temptation is yeah. higher so and the temptation yeah. to make it where it's like a status symbol like you know i've heard of high school graduates and they get engaged you know and then they both go to separate colleges or something and and it's just kind of like a hey let me show my friends and brag to my friends that i'm engaged but it's really just a status symbol and with a you know probably after we both graduate in 4 years we'll get married that's our plan in quotes but it's not you know really set in stone it's just kind of like hey i get to, i just want to show all my friends that i meet in college that i have a ring on my finger you know <laughs> and some of those i've seen those type of things break off and you know in the first semester first year even yeah mm -hmm. uh, so yeah i i don't really personally recommend those type of engagements because yeah you mentioned temptation it's way too long and often it's a status symbol <laughs> yeah so now that we kind of know that statistically <laughs> pre-marriage counseling seems to be important what kind of questions or counsel do you think couples should get Mm. <laughs> so what kinds of questions is this basically about questions that when we have premarital counseling, what should the couple preparing for marriage think through? What kinds of things should they be asked? What things should they be asking themselves and asking each other, you know, as they're preparing for marriage? <laughs> So I did look at two articles kind of to get a perspective. One article, the first one is from thenot.com. So the knot is not technically a Christian site. Now they might have Christian contributors or maybe things like an article here or there that would be geared toward Christians, but it's not. I would consider it secular in general. And so here's an article from The Knot called What to Know About Premarital Counseling from 2019 again. And I pulled out some questions that I thought were good, but as Christians, we often th might think like, yeah, that's important, but it doesn't go far enough <laughs> because they're, you know, it seemed like it's kind of like a little bit more surface level. So some of the questions, it seems it would be focused on are you really ready for this and are you compatible and stuff like that? Have you just thought through some of these things? So the first question is, why are we getting married? And that's a good question. If two people are about to get married and usually premarital counseling happens, you know, possibly in a few weeks before the wedding, maybe a few months, you know, at the latest, I don't know, it's usually pretty close to the wedding. And it's kind of like as, as they're getting closer Here's the last ditch effort to make sure that you've thought through everything. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, it is an important question. The last ditch effort. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yikes! Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kind of being silly, exaggerating a little bit there, but yeah. <laughs> Which is actually interesting because I remember reading in one of the articles that they recommend doing eight weeks of oh, yeah. premarital counseling. Yeah. Which is a big difference between eight hours. Yeah. And, well, well, I, I mean, guess you could do an it, hour yeah, a week. Yeah, but. that's what I'm thinking. It's probably not like eight hours all in one shot. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's that more like a seems, seminar. <laughs> I know. That still seems like not a whole lot, though. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could pack a lot of thought into eight hours, maybe. But, <laughs> yeah, but sure. yeah. Okay. Sorry. One question, <laughs> a good question is, why are we getting married? You know, because 
it is possible there are plenty of people who are jumping into marriage and they never ask themselves, why are we doing this? <laughs> so that is a good first step question. It's one of the foundational ones to ask, you know, if you're going to get married, why are you doing it? <laughs> And another one is, will we have joint or separate accounts, like referring to bank accounts? Now, I've seen, I've looked at several articles, usually from secular sources of marriage counseling, and this is always one of those. And, you know, it's a good question to ask, but, you know, usually from my understanding of the way things ought to be, it normally should be that if you're getting married, you're trusting your spouse and that you're not going to plan to have separate bank accounts. Now, I'm not going to shoot down anyone who has can find legitimate reasons to have separate bank accounts from each other, but I would think mostly, you know, okay, if you're getting married, You should be able to trust your spouse that you could both draw from co-owned bank account. (laughs) Now, you might have separate accounts for different purposes, you know, like here's a savings account, here's a a checking account, here's a a medical expense account, you know, here's a, a vacation account or something like that, you know, but if you're both agreeing like, yes, we must absolutely have different bank accounts, like we just wouldn't even think about owning the same account, then you start to wonder, like, how really joined are you? (laughs) Are you planning for the strong potential that you might break apart? (laughs) Well, I always find that interesting, too, because if something happens to either spouse, Mm. then do they have the ability to access their spouse's account if their name wasn't on it? Mm. Like it wasn't joint? Yeah, there's know. yeah the issue there because then it seems like it's just mostly two two people living together, but they're not really joined. <laughs> you know, filing your taxes, jo- filing jointly or separately. I mean, there could be different tax advantages depending on your activities, but <laughs> that's different from <laughs> joint bank accounts or separate bank accounts. There, mm-hmm. another one is that I see in a lot of them is, do we agree on having children? And if so, when and how many? And that's an important question to ask. You know, if you're going to get married, that's something that you should discuss with each other. Because if you can't agree on children, you know, like one says, I want 20 and the other says, I don't want any, that would be a huge problem. And hopefully if people are going to get married, they're going to agree on this type of thing. (laughs) So I'll have to share our story right quick about that. <laughs> but you'll have to help me remember because I can't remember when I told you how many kids oh, that I wanted. Yeah. Was it after we were married or before? Oh, I think it was before. I, okay. It was, I know we were engaged and okay. I just remember being in the car driving somewhere and we're talking about planning out, asking questions about marriage and what we're going to plan for and asked about children. And you said that we wanted 12 you know you thought <laughs> you've always wanted 12 <laughs> yes and, and you didn't pass out <laughs> yeah, thankfully since I didn't you were pass driving out since i was driving i was behind <laughs> the wheel so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah i i knew that i loved you and that you know hey if god gives us 12 i have no idea how to do it but i know he'll help us and so <laughs> Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> like most people, like oh, I don't yeah. know, even family members will be like, "Are you out of your mind? You want twelve kids?" And I'm like, I don't know. All of our scripture it says how much children are a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's one of my pet peeves <laughs> about how you view children. And from my background, I. All I had was one twin brother. I didn't have any uh, younger siblings, so I never, I'm someone who never babysat until (laughs) we got married. You know, I was no expert at all on what it would be like to take care of children. So, you know, I I didn't really come into this as someone like, I got a handle on this, but I... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> neither did i yeah. <laughs> and i had uh, younger siblings and, and you did babysitting babys- and yeah. took care of children in, a, in medical ways and stuff like that you worked as a pediatrician you know or 
for pediatrics, you know, so you had some understanding of caring for children, but I had like zero, but <laughs> we agreed that children are a blessing from God, you know, despite the fact that I really had no clue. I never changed a diaper. I never babysat or anything like that. Oh, but... <laughs> look at what a wonderful father yeah, you are. And, so. and we have Good four job. children and I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, good job trusting God because you are an awesome daddy. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. And you're an awesome mom of four kids. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to our question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here's the final question that I grabbed Do you believe in monogamy? <laughs> And but I think that's an important question, yeah. but, it, you know, of course, from a Christian perspective, it's almost like it should go without saying, but right. yeah, for those who aren't Christians, it might be an important question to ask each other and, okay, if we're getting married, do you believe that I'm the only one, you know? <laughs> yes, because it's something that you don't really think about how prevalent it is that people have what they call open relationships mm, yeah, where they just both agree agree that they can see whoever whenever and yet they still consider themselves married and mm. I don't know it's just weird yeah. <laughs> like I don't understand that and it's definitely not how God describes what a marriage should be like yeah exactly I mean I, I didn't even write it in my notes but I remember some of these secular articles there's a question like should we have a prenuptial agreement you know mm. and yeah these kind of like stipulated conditions for marriage and stuff it's like yeah that's that's not what we see marriage uh, in the Bible, not mm -hmm. the way we see it there. And so, yeah, prenuptial agreement, you know, I, I just can't even fathom that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, for people who aren't Christians, that <laughs> maybe that's an okay question, but I don't know. Um, so you have some more Christian type yeah. of questions you found, too. What were some of those? Yeah, so this is an article by Renee Fisher contributed to iBelieve.com called 34 Premarital Questions Every Christian Couple Should Ask Before Marriage. And the first question could be asked in non-Christian context, but I think it's a good reflective question. What do you want out of marriage? <laughs> So I think, okay, you know, if that gets the couple talking, you know, and asking each of them to tell the other, what do I want out of marriage that can reveal the purpose of why someone would get married? Because if it says, <laughs> like, I'm thinking of it, if it were like a game show or something, and, and then the guy is asked, what do you want out of marriage? And then he just says, well... I want a woman to cook food for me and wash my clothes and clean my house and pick up my laundry and stuff. Then I can hear the <laughs> wrong answer. <laughs> like, we're not saying that that's wrong, but if that's what you want out of marriage is that you're just looking for someone to do things for you. <laughs> you know, like, like a maid. <laughs> yeah, like a maid. Like, okay, what you really want is a maid, not a wife. And, mm. you know, or a mother, not a wife, you know. <laughs> yeah, so it, this question is good because it can get people to talk about why are we getting married from the other one, but what do you want out of marriage? Marriage, and if what you say you want out of marriage is focused on you, then that might start revealing some red flags as we're, you know, we're going to talk about the idea of red flags as they show up before you say I do and always be ready for these types of red flags because engagement doesn't necessarily commit you to getting married. And yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit. Another question, this is a good one. What has been the hardest season of suffering you've walked through and how has this shaped you? And so that gets really into, you know, when you're thinking of marriage vows, like in rich or poor, in sickness or health, you know, these are the kind of typical vows that people might make. Now, we have modern weddings where the, you know, the husband and my wife might bring their own vows that they say, but usually the vows should include things like, I will love you no matter what or in what kind of condition I will support you, this type of thing. Thing, you know, instead of just pouring out emotions, it should <laughs> talk about in the ups and downs. And so a question that gets you to talk to your spouse to be about 
What have I suffered? How have I gotten through that? How I've put my faith in God even in the hard times. And, and so if you can talk about the hard times and prepare for the hard times with your spouse-to-be, that should be something on your mind. You know, we're getting married not just for the fun times, but we're going to get married to be together and endure the valleys together. <laughs> How is your flame of truth, Christian? Is it burning bright? Hi, I'm Rebecca Bershwinger, creator and host of One Little Candle, a weekly podcast dedicated to encouraging, empowering, and equipping believers to be the light that God has called us to be, so that we may pass down undefiled the truth of God's infallible word to the next generation. So join me and light your own little corner of the world. You can listen to One Little Candle on all major podcast platforms or at christianpodcastcommunity.org. So it's, I was picturing kind of the account in, I can't remember <laughs> which gospel now, maybe you'll remember, um, yeah. with the raging storm and the disciples and Jesus are on the boat and the disciples are getting scared because yeah. the waves are so high and Jesus is sound asleep and they're like, wait, how are you sleeping yeah. through this fierce storm? And I know it's in Mark. I, okay, it might Mark. be in other gospels, but I, know, I remember it being in Mark. <laughs> I was like, I can't remember if it's Mark or Luke. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. But just that, okay, storms come and you don't want to find out that your spouse is the type that's just going to bail yeah. when the first storm comes. Hmm. So talking about, like you mentioned, babe, that how do you handle those stressful times? How do you handle those trying times? And maybe you haven't gone through a whole lot yet, hmm. but understanding that those waves, those storms, those valleys, they do come hmm. at some point. And just coming together and making that agreement that you are going to stick together and stay with each other mm. no matter what. Yes. <laughs> Neither one of you are going to bail when the storms hit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Good thoughts there, sweetheart. Yeah, never going to bail. That's a good <laughs> bail out of marriage. You know, that's <laughs> that's not what marriage is all about. It's not something that, oh, okay, you bail out of <laughs> So I guess like part of that recount of the story with the disciples and Jesus was like, <laughs> okay, the disciples, they weren't jumping like out of the <laughs> waves and like jumping off the boat. They sought Jesus yeah. and are like, okay, what do we do? And then Jesus says like, peace be still. And the storm went away. And that's what we do when the storms that come our way. We don't just jump overboard and we like, <laughs> we're giving up. We're yeah. failing here. We seek Christ, we seek his word and he gives us peace in the middle of that storm. Mm -hmm. And I just, I like that story there. I just think it's really neat to <laughs> think about that in marriage and as yeah. you're preparing for marriage. <laughs> yes, definitely. Here's a third question here. Why has God provided you with a partner? What ministry do you see him working through in your relationship? I think that's a good question for Christians because your life belongs to your Savior. Your your life is not your own. You're bought with a price, as uh, the Apostle Paul says. And so, as a Christian, you're seeking to please and honor and minister to others for God with your life. So, when you're looking for a spouse, when you're planning to get married... How can we minister together? How can we do Christian ministry together? And I like the, it's almost like a rhetorical question. Why has God provided you with a partner? You know, mm -hmm. so, so when you're thinking about getting married, it's just like, why did God do this for you? You know, what's the purpose of this? And f what's God's purpose for this? And as marriage is a ministry in itself, you minister to each other and then you two together minister to others through your marriage. So for some reason, this Bible verse kind of stood out to me in Proverbs. Proverbs 3 verse 3, it says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. I was just thinking as we're discussing about the engagement period and just having these conversations and communicating about what your thoughts are, where you're coming from on these different subjects, it's just so important. 
But a lot of times it seems like people in that engagement period, they're kind of like, oh, I've got the ring. Now I can just sit back and coast. (laughs) But the engagement season is really important to have these conversations, start communicating, because these are things you're going to be doing the rest of your life, Mm. talking about things that come up and learning about where your spouse is at and how you can meet their needs and different things that are going on with the kids. Communication is so essential Mm, that the engagement time is just kind of laying the foundation for that. So it's not a time to just kind of coast, but it's a time to be more proactive. And I think that one thing that kind of came up in our seminar this weekend that I really liked was these questions aren't really to determine if you're compatible Mm, with someone. (laughs) Oh, that word compatible that shows up a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And the speaker pointed out that we're not compatible. You won't be compatible with someone because we're made differently. That's how God made us. Men and women are made differently. Mm, yeah. But that's what God wanted. He, that's why he made a man and a woman <laughs> yeah. to be different and to come together and be something beautiful and unique. Mm. And I think that during these conversations in the engagement season is not looking to see if you're compatible, but more looking at, are there any red flags that we're seeing? Because you haven't made that covenant commitment in marriage yet. Mm. This is still kind of a testing time where you're digging a little bit deeper into the Mm. person that you are going to spend the rest of your life with. And an engagement doesn't mean like everything is set in stone. Yeah. I'm going to say you haven't chiseled it in the tablet there. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the books I was looking at that has really good questions to kind of consider, we haven't personally read the whole book. We were just kind of looking through some of the questions, but it's called Before You Say I Do. And another book was 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged. Both these books are by H. Norman Wright. They looked really good and just kind of engaging in those deep questions and conversations with the person that you're going to be getting married to. But he said, don't ignore the red flags (laughs) and keep making excuses for them, especially in that engagement period, Mm -hmm. because you're digging deeper. You're not committed yet. Mm -hmm. You're hoping you're leading up to that commitment. But if things come up, you need to be able to recognize that and be willing to say this is not going to work. Yeah. And you mentioned the red flags that come up, like say, you know, you find out your spouse to be has some serious addiction to something or has a past that was secret, you know, just things like that. And, you know, you said like if you're engaged and then you learn these things, you're not obligated to get married. You can break that off. But a lot of problems with some people when they're the red flag show up is that it's like they think, Oh, well I'll get him or her to change, you know? (laughs) And as I think, you know, some people it's like is investing in this wedding, you know, (laughs) putting the time and effort into this. If he's willing to do this and do the whole ceremony and bring his family and friends there to it, then he must be serious enough that he loves me and he's willing to give up these things for my sake. (laughs) And unfortunately, I think that sets up people for disaster when typically like maybe the woman who's going to get married thinks that the man, if he has the red flags, that he's going to (laughs) change. If he's willing to marry me, that shows that he loves me. And if he loves me, that shows that he would be willing to get rid of those red flags for my sake. And I would say normally to that kind of situation, the man who has the red flag is likely thinking, well, she's willing to marry me despite these problems, therefore they must not be a big deal, so I just got to get through the wedding. Then I can just maybe suppress them a little bit until then, but then once we're married, now I'm free and (laughs) we're good and she doesn't have a problem with them and those red flags can lead to disasters. Red flag should mean you're willing to break it off (laughs) rather than brush them aside. (laughs) And so, yeah, when it comes to before you say I do, you got to think beyond the wedding, you know, because getting married 
is not just all about the wedding. I know often for the bride, there's a lot of emphasis on that wedding ceremony and the groom might be like, okay, I don't know what goes into this. She knows I don't. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know my um, pewter from my <laughs> silver or something you know, for color schemes. You know, just all I know is I got to walk the aisle and stand there and exchange rings and vows and stuff like that, you know, <laughs> and then <laughs> I think a lot of guys, you know, just they don't know anything about weddings and what goes into them. So, you know, but, <laughs> but you got to think, yes, do plan out the, you know, wonderful ceremony and wedding and stuff like that. But there's more as you're getting ready to the wedding. The wedding isn't the end of a Hallmark movie. It's the beginning of your life together. And so being single, even as you're dating, even as you're engaged, being single people in love and doing things together on dates is entirely different from being married and living together. And that can be, you know, an issue for some people if they haven't really planned thinking through their life as actually living with the person that they're dating. It's entirely different if the couple hasn't asked the questions and haven't thought through the seasons of marriage. And that we talked about in the retreat that we went to, there was the idea brought up about seasons. And, you know, you got to go through together the seasons of marriage. And so the speaker mentioned things like, okay, marriage, get the wedding is a season. The honeymoon is a season. When you have your first child, babies are a season. Toddlers, that can be a different season. If you change jobs, if you lose a job, you look for a job, that's another season. If you have to move somewhere, that's a season. And, you know, he mentioned you know, which we've had to go through like a miscarriage, you know, and enduring things like that together, those heartbreaks, that is a season and your children in school or homeschooling, you know, that's a season teenagers, you know, that can be a season, you know, <laughs> and if they go to college, that's another season, you know, or if you become empty nesters, that's another season of your marriage, you know, always thinking through how do we go through all these different seasons together. So think of the single people I mentioned that are dating, that are engaged, you know, if they haven't prepared for the reality of difficult times together, just the feelings of infatuation and euphoria when you're single isn't going to account for the changes that marriage brings to your life. And marriage is simply not going to look and feel like that meet, date, part ways, you know, that the dating life is like, where you still maintain your private single existence, <laughs> and then you present yourself to your date, your fiance, putting your best foot forward, you know, kind of in the way that you want to present yourself to that person, but you still don't present yourself all the time, you know, like, I don't know if you, you know, understand that, sweetheart, the idea of how different it is if you're single compared to you're married, you're living together, all of your habits and so on are there, your bedtime routine, that's now something that your spouse experiences with you, that just, how you get up in the morning, your morning routine, you know, if that was some, that, that becomes totally different from, you know, if you're single to, you know, when you're married, um, how you spend your Saturdays, <laughs> yeah, are you going you to yeah. sit on the computer playing <laughs> yeah. video games yeah. all day, or are you going to focus on your wife and your <laughs> yeah, relationship exactly. and do things together and yeah, so it's definitely a different mindset going from <laughs> yeah. being single. Yeah. And that's one thing that I don't necessarily like about the whole dating scene <laughs> is that, yeah, you're just putting on a front for a yeah. few hours and that's really easy to do. You're not really getting to know that person. <laughs> and so yeah. having the opportunities to see them in different situations mm. around different yeah. people for longer periods of yeah. time than just a couple hours gives you a little more insight to who that person is. But marriage is still another <laughs> step from that, of course, too. And I like how you um, mentioned just trying to prepare and be aware that 
it's something that's going to change. <laughs> yeah, exactly, sweetheart. And I remember at the retreat, the speaker mentioned mocking like the idea, like arguments with habits and stuff. Like he has a PhD and he can't even put his socks in the hamper, you know. <laughs> Can't even put the socks in the laundry basket, you know. Like he has well credentialed, he has a doctorate, but he can't even do that, you know. <laughs> that does kind of illustrate the point, you know, like habits. How often we've heard of couples arguing, getting in really, <laughs> you know, intense arguments and fights over things like habits. And those things are, you know, if you're not married yet, you're single. Those are things that you might not talk about or you might not show to your spouse. So, yeah, like as you're thinking about getting married and you got to know how much that changes, you must be willing to adjust for the sake of your spouse. Like the infamous <laughs> toothpaste and toilet paper. Oh, yeah. You squeeze the tube in the middle. You don't roll it up from the bottom or yeah. <laughs> or vice versa. Oh, yeah. Thankfully, we're kind of both on the uh, same page yeah. for yeah. toothpaste and toilet paper and, yeah, uh, and laundry. Yeah, <laughs> I would say like if I were one of those, someone who chokes the toothpaste tube from the middle, I would hope that I would learn quickly to, you know, but <laughs> I'm, I'm someone who squeezes it from the bottom and tries to get every ounce out of it that I can. And yeah. But things like that, I mean, they're good to think through, and, <laughs> but those are areas where you give each other grace. Yeah. And I think that's so important in, in the engagement period and also in your marriage. Hmm. But knowing, okay, is this a situation where we extend grace or is this a situation where this is a red flag hmm. and you're kind of like, um, we need to dig into this a little bit more <laughs> and just kind of having that wisdom and insight to what hmm. issues to address because fighting over how you squeeze the toothpaste <laughs> should not make or break your relationship. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. It, you know, if you're going to allow pornography hmm. into the home is a huge issue yeah. that could potentially make or break a relationship. Hmm. So just having that wisdom and insight of what are the red flags and which ones are more like you said a habit <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> i just... would say you know a habit like that is not shouldn't be a red flag but if someone mm -hmm. is willing to go to the mat to defend their habit like that maybe that would be a red flag <laughs> yes, you know? true. like who's willing to to arm wrestle his spouse over the over the idea that he simply will not change his laundry or toothpaste habit you know like <laughs> for her sake or so on you know like yeah that probably reflects a bigger issue you know <laughs> that's a symptom of a bigger issue but yeah <laughs> yes excellent point <laughs> yeah. it makes me think of this verse you know, ephesians five twenty eight, which says so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself and that sounds kind of strange that, like, wait why can't i just love myself well the Apostle Paul makes the point that every man loves himself, you know, wants to care for himself some way that you prefer, but you truly love yourself if you love your wife because you've come one flesh. So you're always seeking the good of your wife. And so if your wife has a problem with your habits, you know, like if you really love your wife, you're willing to adjust and change for her sake. You know, why would you let that? That become a wedge between you, you know, then why did you get married if you're not willing to adjust a habit or two? <laughs> that also gets to the one of those things, one of those excuses for how marriages end, which this is like a, I guess, a thing to think about before I, you know, you say I do, because one of the biggest excuses for ending marriage is, well, we're just not compatible or we're just found ourselves growing apart. We hear that a lot. And so like, what exactly does it mean by compatible? I know we, you know, we mentioned that a little earlier, but we mentioned that, you know, as the speaker at, a, at the marriage retreat said about 
men and women are different. And that should be a good thing because you're not marrying yourself. You're not marrying your twin. If you're a man, you're not marrying another man. You're marrying a woman and God made men and women different. This is to complement each other in your differences, you know, to strengthen each other in the relationship. And so you get to know, you get to learn as a guy, you get to learn women in general and you get to learn how your spouse is different from you as a woman and as a unique individual and that's how you grow together and if you're just looking for someone who's compatible you're not looking for marriage in particular you're looking for a buddy you know your friend to play video games with or whatever or you're looking for a dog you know a pet You're not looking for a spouse. And if you think that your spouse is just going to be along for the ride, you know, then you're not really ready for marriage then. (laughs) So this just reminds me about my favorite marriage movie, Fireproof. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) And the part where they're talking about how to study your spouse. Like you're constantly learning about each other. And that learning starts to an extent when you're engaged, you're trying to learn about the other person with some of these questions we've talked about, but that learning never stops. And like you mentioned earlier, there's all these different seasons you go through because there's always something new to learn about or something to talk about. And so I think just the most important key from all of this is to start having conversations and start talking about things because Mm. the more you have these conversations and communicating Mm. about not just, you know, what's your favorite color or (laughs) what should we do on Saturday, (laughs) but having these deep, meaningful conversations will always make you draw closer and (laughs) help you improve your relationship. Even if conflict comes up in that, mm, yeah. conflict can actually bring you closer together. <laughs> yes. As long as you know how to handle conflict. <laughs> yeah. And if you need tips, we do have a <laughs> yeah. episode on that. Yeah, we did two episodes on conflict resolution and kind of what well, the first one, you know, we had skits at the beginning of these to kind of illustrate the first one was kind of like what not to say. And we had like a skit kind of like where we're arguing and, you know, everything goes downhill there. And then the second part was where we start with a conflict and then we resolve it. So it's kind of like things that you should do to resolve a conflict. And yeah, so I would highly recommend you listen to those to get ideas about conflict resolution and a lot of the key to that is proper communication (laughs) and yeah communication is very important and as before you say i do the premarital counseling by asking questions is helping you to communicate and dig deeper you know these types of questions where the people are just going to be quick to jump into marriage because they found someone who's attractive but not really getting to know them deeply these questions for premarital counseling which we'd highly recommend especially for a christian premarital counseling it the questions as you know some of them we looked at before earlier they get you to dig deep and ask yourself why am i getting married why is god provide me a partner and they help the both of you in answering those questions to communicate because you're finding you're going to marry someone who's going to be and should be your best friend, your closest friend that you live with all the time and that you're supposed to communicate with the most. And so communication is one of the most important things. And so before you say, I do plan that you're going to communicate with each other and be open to anything and everything, no secrets from your spouse. And (laughs) and I bring up this one quickly this one article by a jessica stillman for inc.com inc incorporated or something you know it's five secrets of enduring love from couples who have been married for decades and so yeah if we're gonna think about okay if you're thinking about marriage 
you should be thinking about living with this person for as long as you both shall live. You know, you're not making a contract to break, you're making a covenant for life. And so who better to talk about the success of marriage, what keeps them together than older couples who've been married for decades and So this gerontologist (laughs) from Cornell University named Carl Pillimer, after interviewing some older couples, here are some of the things that he learned from them as to how they stayed together. And some of these things, you know, I want to say, duh, but it it really can be groundbreaking for maybe some newer couples who haven't really thought through these kind of deep but basic things. The first one is, as we mentioned, learn to communicate. (laughs) And that is one of the things that a lot of couples struggle with because they don't communicate. They might read between the lines. They might make assumptions. There might be the passive aggressive thing, you know, where it's like in the retreat, maybe the the wife might be expecting, why can't my husband read my mind? And so the wife might have to learn that, okay, if I really need him to do things, just ask, just tell him. And the husband needs to realize, well, the wife will process things more emotionally or might need to communicate more than he might be thinking that he needs or wants, so be willing to listen. So that's part of communication is listening. And that seems like a basic thing, but what holds marriage together is communication. (laughs) And then the second one is get to know your partner very well before marrying. And you might think this is pretty obvious. Like, if you're going to live together, if you're thinking about marrying someone, wouldn't you want to know that person in some way before you get married? It's not an acquaintance. Why would you get married to someone that you barely know? But, you know, so, yeah, involves things beyond surface level dating, just having fun experiences together, but actually getting to know the person deeply. (laughs) So I liked your illustration of that when we were talking about this earlier. I think it's just funny because our kids really like these. They're called blind bags or mystery bags where you just get a bag and you can't tell what figure is in there. Yeah, like an action figure in a bag. And okay, am I going to get the complete set here? Let's see, I have the uh, number one, number two figure. So on. like if I buy a new one, you know, and open it up, which one am I going to get? And yeah. so you're like, okay, you don't want your marriage to be like opening a mystery bag on your wedding day. <laughs> yeah. What kind of spouse am I getting? Hmm, let's open it up on our wedding day. Yeah. But actually, like, it doesn't have to be a mystery. You yeah. talk and learn about each other yeah. and get to know each other. Yeah, get to know each other in conversation very well. Not just what kind of food is this person like when we go on a date, you know. As we mentioned in earlier episodes, get to know their hopes and dreams, get to know (laughs) deeply as a person, you know. Number three from the older couples, treat marriage as an unbreakable lifelong commitment. In other words, a covenant. So these older couples have been married for decades. They had the correct view of marriage that it's, we are in this together. We are in this for the long haul, come what may, you know, and a lot of people today treat marriage as a contract as just, we're doing this because we have feelings for each other. But once the feelings get challenged by challenging circumstances, then you ask the questions like, wait, are we really compatible or, you know, are we drifting apart or so I didn't sign up for this. You know, like I didn't sign up for this difficulty, you know, like, you know, well, if you can't deal with the difficulties together, then maybe you're not ready for marriage. The Dr. Carl Pillimer said this, that he gathered from the older couples. He said, quote, rather than seeing marriage as a voluntary partnership that lasts only as long as the passion does, the elders propose a mindset in which it is a profound commitment to be respected, even if things go sour over the short term. <laughs> oh, yeah, I really like that. So I put that in the notes. And yeah, to me, it seems like it's obvious because this is what the biblical definition of marriage is. But for some people, it's kind of like a, you know, <laughs> a startling discovery, you know, like, wow, you could do that. Yeah, that's what you're 
That's what you're signing up for when you get married. <laughs> and then number four was learn to work as a team.、Mm. And all of these are quite obvious. They're like the living, breathing definition of a marriage. But yeah, unfortunately, you know, people don't think of marriage. In Bible terms, for the way God designed the institution, where a man leaves his father and mother, cleaves to his wife, they two become one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man separate. <laughs> I remember reading a st-、uh, some statistic when I was looking at things for notes here, and it's like the average is spent on a wedding ceremony is about twenty thousand dollars. But you know, approximately half of marriages end in divorce. You know, that's pretty interesting that there'd be so much focus on the glitz and glamour of a few hours of one day to say that you're joining together with this person, but there isn't investment in <laughs> the life together through trials and tribulations, the good times, the bad, the mountains and the valleys. And before you say "I do." <laughs> That same passion, that same investment that you put into a wedding ceremony. Well, how much more should be be investing in the life of marriage together, getting to know your spouse, communicating, preparing, asking the questions, like as we mentioned for premarital counseling, things like that. How do we see ourselves enduring difficult times? What have we endured, and how will we endure things together? And yeah. So we hope that we've given you some、uh, food for thought for, especially those of you who are getting close to saying "I do." You're engaged, and we highly recommend premarital counseling there, and really to ask the important questions before the wedding, so that the wedding is the start. Of a beautiful relationship together, so stay tuned for the next episode of Truth Espresso. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey, friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso.